present-day Turkey is a matter of, for prayer. We have to realize that Turkey is one of the most resistant countries to the gospel. It's a great, great Muslim stronghold. But we also remember that the people who live in Turkey now are not the people who lived in Turkey in the first century. There were aboriginal people and Greek colonists who populated Turkey. But the people who rule Turkey now are a part of a great migration from Central Asia, which took place about a thousand years ago. And so the, the people group dominating Turkey now are not the people group who dominated Turkey in the first century. But when you think of all three missionary journeys, when you think of Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, when you think of the fact that the Apostle John spent so much time in Asia Minor, when you think of the fact that Timothy was the pastor of the church in, at Ephesus, probably the Virgin Mary spent her last days in Ephesus. When you think of the fact that all seven of the churches written in the book of Revelation were written to churches in Asia Minor, it's amazing how much gospel effort was made in that part of the world and how little fruit has come in recent years and over a thousand years from that part of the world. Turkey is a hard, resistant place. My own daughter has spent two years in Turkey as a missionary under the radar, undercover, and it's still a great matter of prayer. Paul goes back there. He tells the people in Ephesus in verse 21, this is Acts 18, 21, I'll come back if I can. I'll come back if God wills. And he does go back. Um, he, he finds, he returns to Ephesus in verse 24, and there is a, a Jew in Ephesus called Apollos. We don't know very much about Apollos. We know where he was from. We know that he was a great preacher, a great speaker. And we know that uh, Aquila and Priscilla had to help him because he had an imperfect understanding of the gospel. He knew a little bit. He was a good steward of what he knew. But he really only knew the gospel up through the ministry of John the Baptist. And Priscilla and Aquila explain the fuller New Testament message to him uh, more thoroughly. Some scholars believe that Apollos is the man who wrote the book of Hebrews. Nobody really knows who wrote Hebrews, but scholars who really, really know Greek tell us that the Greek of Hebrews has a certain Alexandrian flavor. It seems obvious that the person who wrote the book of Hebrews was a great orator. There are certain features in the book of Hebrews which lead us to believe that. And some people say, well, Apollos fits that description. He was from Alexandria. He was an orator. Probably he was the author, but nobody really knows who wrote, um, who wrote the book of Hebrews. He was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures. What a wonderful um, description, as well as being fervent in spirit. In verse 26, is a model of discipleship. He knows a lot, he's very gifted, but he doesn't know enough. So older, wiser Christians take him aside and they disciple him, they teach him. There are three relationships that you ought always to have in your life. You need to have a, a, a relationship of servanthood to somebody who's older in the Lord, or perhaps somebody who has a place of authority in your church you need to have a relationship of servanthood to them. Allow them to mentor you. Uh, allow yourself to serve them. You need to have a relationship of evangelism toward people who don't know Christ. Don't ever drift into a Christian ghetto. Don't ever remain in a place where all of your contacts, all of your relationships, all of your social um, experience is with believers. Now, you can't let unbelievers affect you with worldliness. You've got to impact them with the gospel. So there's a danger 
and being involved with unbelievers. Remember, you can go anywhere among unbelievers as long as you're a missionary. It's not where you go, it's what you do when you get there. If you're going to a place where unbelievers are affecting you with their thinking, affecting you with worldliness, then you've got to stay away from there. But if in that place you are affecting them with the news about Jesus Christ, as long as you're a missionary, you can go anywhere. Christ went to places and Christ spent time with people who sh and it shocked the religious people of His generation. But He was always impacting them with the gospel. He was never allowing them to impact Him with worldliness. The third kind of relationship you need to maintain is a relationship of discipleship. You need to find somebody who doesn't know as much about the gospel as you do, and you need to instruct that person. You need to help that person. Maybe a younger person, maybe a younger Christian, or somebody who hasn't been a Christian very long. This is the relationship which Priscilla and Aquila had with Apollos. And we see it in Ephesus, and we see it in verse 26. He wants to leave Ephesus and go over to Greece, and he does that. And um, while he was in Corinth, um, he found some disciples. And it's, it's like Paul and, and Apollos kind of trade places. Apollos goes from Ephesus to Corinth. Paul goes from Corinth to Ephesus as he remains there, as he comes to there on the third missionary journey. Okay, Paul comes to Ephesus in chapter 19. I said it was chapter 18, but it's chapter 19. And he says to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we did not even we had not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Okay, now. When we studied Acts 8, we talked about this controversy among Christians. Is the reception of the Holy Spirit a second work? Do we become Christians and then later are we baptized in the Holy Spirit? Do we become a Christian and then later we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Is there a fuller gospel? Is there a second work of grace? Some Christians say yes, some Christians say no. The Christians who say yes point to the situation in Samaria in Acts 8 for support. They also point to the situation in Acts 19 for support. The situation in Ephesus is a little bit different than the um, situation in, in Samaria. Uh, Paul says to them, uh, hey, Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They said, we don't even know anything about the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 19.2. Paul says, well, when you were baptized, what kind of baptism did you receive? They said, well, we received the baptism of John. When Paul heard this, he baptized them again in the name of Jesus. And when he baptized them, he laid his hands on them, he baptized them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, it says in verse 6, and they began to speak in tongues, and they began to prophesy. Um, this is another controversy. Is the baptism of the Holy Spirit always associated with speaking in tongues? Some Christians say yes, some Christians say no. Now, in the book of Acts, at least certainly in Acts 2, the tongues which are spoken are a known language. When we read the book of 1 Corinthians, it's not so clear that all the tongue speaking going on in the first century church was speaking in a known language. I'm not going to get into this controversy. I'm not going to try to solve the controversy. I, I will say this, though. If you look at 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says that everyone in Corinth was baptized in the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Now, if the baptism of the Holy Spirit is always a second work, 
which takes place through some kind of fuller experience of the Holy Spirit after conversion, if that's true, it would be very unusual that everyone in Corinth would have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Corinth was not a place where there were a lot of mature Christians. Corinth was not a place noted for committed, mature Christians who didn't need a whole lot of work in their life. Quite the opposite. Corinth was known as a place of immature and confused Christians. For Paul to say that they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit would be very surprising if indeed the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a fuller thing which happened later for the mature and for the committed. But there's something else in 1 Corinthians 12. In verse 13, he says that everybody was baptized in the Holy Spirit. But in, chapter, in verse 30, he says, not everybody speaks in tongues. So if you put 1 Corinthians 12, 13 together with 1 Corinthians 12, 30, it's hard to make the argument that a person who does not speak in tongues is not baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's hard to make the argument that everyone who's baptized in the Holy Spirit speaks in tongues. So what's happening in Ephesus? Well, I think what's happening in Ephesus, like what was happening in Samaria in chapter 8, is that there were people out there, people like Apollos, who was faithful to everything he knew, but he didn't know everything. There were people out there who were saved under a kind of Old Testament arrangement, but they're living in a New Testament age. They were born in the Old Testament age. They die in the New Testament age. They've been baptized, but it's the baptism of John. Do they have all the benefits of the new covenant which come with knowing Christ? No, they don't. They believed what John said as he pointed to Christ. They were baptized with the baptism of John. Are they saved? Will they go to heaven with they, when they die? Yes. But do they have all the benefits of Christianity? Not yet. They don't know about Christ's death. They don't know about the resurrection. They don't know about the descent of the Holy Spirit. And all the benefits which come with New Testament salvation proceed from Jerusalem through the ministry of the apostles. Paul is an apostle. When Paul gets to Ephesus, when he comes back to Ephesus, and he can spend a little time there on the third missionary journey, he lays his hands on them. He preaches a more complete version of the truth to them. He tells them about things they do not know. They submit to full Christian baptism. They receive the Holy Spirit, they begin to prophesy, they begin to speak in tongues. Now, is this easy to understand? No. Um, are there going to be disagreements about exactly what's happening? Yes. Are some people, Christians, going to believe that this is to be the normal experience, that we become Christians and later uh, we receive the Holy Spirit and we speak in tongues, and that's a normal pattern for today. Is it easy to understand why some Christians would believe that? Yes, it is easy to understand. And it's easy to understand why they point to Acts 19 to try to prove their point. The only thing I'm saying is that there's another way of understanding Acts 19, especially when you read Acts 19 along with 1 Corinthians 12. Do I think that you receive the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you become a Christian? Yes, I do. Do I think that speaking in tongues is the necessary sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No, I don't. Am I saying that you should not speak in tongues? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not criticizing that gift. As a matter of fact, we are forbidden to forbid people from speaking in tongues. So I'm not saying anything about that gift. If you practice that gift, I'm not telling you not to practice it. I think the danger 
is that Christians with a non-charismatic understanding of, of our experience in Christ have a, have a tendency to look down on charismatic Christians and say, well, they're not well taught, they don't know doctrine, they're confused, and they're basing their Christian life on experience. I think the tendency of charismatic Christians is to look at non-charismatic Christians and say, they're dead, they're cold, they don't believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They're not experiencing the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I think we need to be gracious and charitable toward Christians who have a different understanding of the Holy Spirit than we do and who have a different experience of the Holy Spirit than we do. We need to keep studying the Bible together prayerfully and we need to keep being positive toward other Christians who have a different understanding and a different experience than we do. My experience is non-charismatic. I have never spoken in tongues. But I'm glad for Christians who have that experience. And I say, God bless them. And I want to learn from them. I don't want to teach them or regard them as someone who needs to be taught from me. Let's be charitable and positive as we try to understand the Word of God together. There were about 12 men there who received these gifts and who were baptized by Paul. Paul then goes back to the synagogue. Now, this is very interesting. In chapter 13 in Pisidian Antioch, Paul says, I'm through with the Jews. I'm going to concentrate on the Gentiles. In um, chapter... 18. Paul says, I'm through with the Jews. I'm going to concentrate on the Gentiles. Acts 18, 6. But when he gets to Ephesus on the third missionary journey, what does he do? He goes to the synagogue. And he begins talking to the Jews. As a matter of fact, he spends three months there in the synagogue at Ephesus speaking out, trying to persuade them about the um, kingdom of God. Now, Paul's a Jew. On Saturday, he's going to go to the synagogue. That's who he is. And wherever he is, he's going to talk about Jesus. So he may have meant that the main emphasis of my ministry is the Gentiles. It may have meant that my main expectation of my ministry is the Gentiles. It may have meant that when I think about my ministry, I think of myself as a missionary to the Gentiles. But that doesn't mean that when he encounters Jews, he's never going to witness to Jews. That doesn't mean that on a Saturday he's never going to go to the synagogue. You know, I'm a missionary. I left America. I'm glad I get to visit America. My children are in America. Today, my wife is in America. I was in America at Christmas. I left America. I'm a missionary to Eastern Europe and the Mideast. Does that mean that when I go to America, I'm never going to witness to an American? Does that mean that I don't go to American churches? Of course not. Of course not. But I don't view myself as, an America, as a minister to America or a missionary to America. My ministry is not in America. I have no desire for my ministry to be in America. But when I'm in America, I'm going to talk about Jesus. When Paul goes to the synagogue, he talks about Jesus. But, but, the same thing happened. Verse 9 says, when some were becoming hardened and disobedient and they began to blaspheme too, they began to speak evil of the way. Remember Acts 11, Christians are first called Christians in Antioch. Now Acts 19 in Ephesus, Christianity is called the way. There's actually a cult today which is called the way. So the cults try to borrow and steal from Christian reality. 
and they hijack these terms and use the terms for their own evil purposes. But in Ephesus, in Acts 19, Christianity is called the way. So he withdraws after he's attacked from the synagogue, and he comes to a place called the School of Tyrannus, and it says that he taught there for two years. Evidently, this was a hall where some kind of instruction went on, and evidently, it was a place where um, that Paul rented so that Christians could meet. So you've got Christian meetings in the synagogue, you've got Christian meetings in, a, in houses, and now you've got Christian meetings in a rented hall, the school of Tyrannus. Um, some years ago, outside of Ephesus, there was a Christian Bible school called the School of Tyrannus, a Christian ministry for Turks. I actually preached a graduation commitment in that place in Turkey some 10 years ago. I'm not sure it still exists. Hard, hard going to keep Christian ministry going in the country of Turkey. But this is the hall, the School of Tyrannus near Ephesus, Acts chapter 19, where Paul was a lecturer and an evangelist and an apologist for two years. It says, many in Asia Minor heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks, and mighty, mighty miracles were taking place under the hand of Paul. Even handkerchiefs that he had touched were healing people. Amazing. So he's not only preaching the truth in Ephesus, but he's working mighty miracles in Ephesus. TVS is a perfect way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support our educational and outreach ministry today. We exist solely upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvseminary.com. There were Jewish miracle workers in that day who tried to steal the name of the Lord Jesus, thinking that Paul was working magic by using what we would call an incantation, which means magic words, a certain formula. You know, Aladdin gets to the cave of Ali Baba. This is, a, of course, an Arab fairy tale. He hears that Ali Baba and his thieves speak words to the door of the cave, open sesame, and the door comes open. Aladdin hears this. So when Aladdin comes to the door of the cave when the thieves are away, he says open sesame and the door comes open, just like it does for the owners, because he knows the magic words. The Jewish exorcists, who also tried to throw demons out, but they're not Christians, they hear the great things that, Je that Paul is doing in the name of Jesus. So they try to say the same words and use the name of Jesus to work their magic. Well, it doesn't work. The demon actually speaks to these Jewish Exorcist, these seven brothers, the sons of a Jewish priest, Acts 19.15, and they say to him, the demon says to these young men, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul. They use the magic. They, they speak to the demonized person, and they say, we command you in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, come out of this person. The demon then answers back, well, I know this name Jesus, I know this name Paul, but I don't know you. And so the, the, the demon, through the man, attacks them, and he overpowers them. He actually tears their clothes off and hurts them, and they run out of the building. Very, very embarrassed. And this became known. So it became known that Jesus was not just a name that you could say. But Jesus was a person whom you must know personally and whom you must believe in if the right kind of power was going to come to you and through you in Jesus' name. 
See, it's not just a formula. It's not just magic words. It's not just a ritual. But it has, it has to be a living reality. Christ must be known personally. And that's what they were learning in Ephesus. It says, many who had believed kept coming. Now, something else happens. They're not only confessing the name of Jesus, but they're giving up their evil ways. They are abandoning magic. They're abandoning occultic practices. And they're actually destroying very valuable property, which they themselves own, which is associated with these magic practices. Now, Christianity has been attacked because of this. In Acts 18, we have this amazing phenomenon of people who had been involved in occult practices renouncing those practices. It says in verse 17 that fear fell upon all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. That is, the fact of Christ's person and work was becoming a big deal in Ephesus. And it was become so important that it says in verse 18 that many of those who believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. That is, they were revealing things that they had been doing either before they became a Christian or things that they were doing in secret. You know, occasionally, uh, someone who's supposed to be a Christian, even a Christian leader, is caught in some terrible sin. Maybe it's a sin of dishonesty. Maybe he's been taking money. Maybe it's a sin of immorality. Maybe he's been involved with someone he's not married to. We hear of these sad cases from time to time, and they're very, very sad indeed. Usually, I'm, usually, I'm only curious about one thing. I want to know if the person was caught, or I want to know if the person came forward and confessed. It doesn't mean that if a person is caught that they cannot genuinely and sincerely repent. It just means that it's harder for us to know that they're really repenting. If a person is not caught, but if a person confesses and reveals that he's been doing something wrong, something shameful, something embarrassing, something that's going to cost him in terms of public opinion and maybe cost him his job or his ministry, then we can be more sure that that person is really repenting because that person is exposing himself. He's unmasking himself. He's telling us something we wouldn't know if he hadn't told us. It's a wonderful mark of repentance. You know, who we really are as Christians is revealed by what we do that only God knows about. It's who we are in secret is who we really are. The person I really am is not the person in this class. This is who I want you to believe that I am while I'm in front of you. The person I really am is who I am when I'm in private, when no one is looking. Moody said character is what a man does in the dark. And one sure sign of repentance and one sure sign of, of revival, one sure sign that the Holy Spirit has taken over is when Christians come forward and they confess their secret sins. I mentioned a while ago that, um, that there was great revival in the country of Korea. That revival began in 1907 when two pastors confessed their sins to each other and asked forgiveness. And there was great revival in Ephesus because the Christians were confessing their sins and they were renouncing especially their sins which had to do with occult practices and false religion. Now, I mentioned to you that Christianity is attacked because of something that happens here. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of all. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. These were valuable books. They didn't say, well, I'm a Christian now, I'm going to sell these books. They said, I'm a Christian now, I'm going to destroy these books. 
so that they got no profit from getting rid of these things, getting these things out of their house. Now, here's the problem. When the Nazis took over Germany in 1933, they obviously would not allow any other ideology but their own to be publicly studied in Nazi Germany. They were obviously very, very um, hateful toward the Jews. They hated the Jews. First they took their rights away and then they tried to kill all of them. Well, one of the things that they did was that they burned the books of authors who disagreed with them. Social Democrats, Bolsheviks, and Jews. They burned the books of the great author who wrote in German, Franz Kafka, because he was a Jew. He lived in Czechoslovakia, but he wrote in German. But he was a Jew. They burned his books. He died in 1923. He died a long time earlier, but they burned his books because he was a Jewish author. Well, and so then we see in the New Testament, well, they also, these Christians also burn books in the New Testament. They're like Nazis. No, 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 no. The Nazis were burning somebody else's books. The Nazis were burning books which didn't belong to them. The Christians were burning their property. The Nazis were destroying value and profit which would have gone to somebody else. The Christians were destroying valuable possessions which they would have benefited from economically. But the Christians regarded the spiritual danger as being more important than the economic benefit. So these Christians took their own books. It would be like a man who had a collection of pornography, maybe a collection of pornography which he could sell and get money for, but he becomes a Christian. When he becomes a Christian, he doesn't keep his pornography. He doesn't sell his pornography. He burns his pornography because he, real, he realizes it's wrong. That's a part of my old life. That's not going to have anything to do with me anymore. I'm a believer now. My life has changed. My life is new. Well, these Ephesians were involved in occult practices. So they gathered together all those things which were involved, which was connected with their occult practices, including the books which showed them how to practice the occult. And they burned those things to show their sincerity that they really were breaking with the old life, even though it cost them money to break with the old life. And it says in verse 20, that the Word of God was growing mightily, and the Word of God was prevailing. But a time came when Paul was done, and he wasn't going to stay in Ephesus where he taught for two years and where there had been great benefit. He decides that he's going to go to to Jerusalem, and so he goes through Macedonia, and he purposes to go to Rome, and uh, he's planning on going to Rome. He, he plans on going through Macedonia and Greece and going on to Rome. So he sends Timothy and Erastus on ahead of him, but he remained back in Ephesus for a while, and at that time there was a riot. And here's what happens. The people who were not converted to Christianity realize that if Christianity takes hold in Ephesus, certain ways of making money in Ephesus were not going to work anymore. So again, this is an attack brought on by capitalists, people who made money off false religion. If you're going to worship idols, somebody's got to make the idols. And the people who make the idols have to be paid. Many of the idols were in silver. So there was a silversmith named Demetrius who realized, I'm not going to have as much money anymore because Christianity is growing and being influential. If we're going to save our jobs, if we're going to be able to make a living, we're going to have to fight. So he gathered together the other people who worked in metal and who worked in silver and who, who made money through idols, and he says in verse 25, our prosperity depends upon this business. In other words, 
These false religions make money for us. Therefore, those who teach another religion, we've got to stop them because if we don't stop them, we're going to lose our money. Now, they pretend to have a religious motive because they say that Paul says that the gods made with hands are not gods at all. And that's true. That's exactly what Paul taught in Athens in chapter 17. That's exactly what Paul is teaching in Ephesus in chapter 19. And Demetrius says, we've got to stop him. There's a danger. But then he pretends to care about the great goddess uh, Artemis. That she will be regarded as worthless. That she will... Um, that her worship will be abandoned, and then our business will be worthless. And Ephesus was a, a place where uh, Artemis also called Diana, the goddess of the hunt, the goddess of the moon, was a place where she was worshipped. And there was a great temple to her there. And, you know, if you go to a great cathedral, say, in Rome or in Vienna or in Budapest or in Moscow, there are little shops all around the temple, all around the cathedral, and they sell little books, and they sell pictures, and they sell statues, and they sell jewelry, which has to do with the cathedral. It's like that also in pagan worship. The, the fact that there was a great temple there meant that there was a lot of money to be made. When people came there to worship Diana, Artemis, the Greek name was Artemis, the Roman name was Diana, they wanted to buy little souvenirs. They wanted to buy little idols to help them worship. They wanted to buy little souvenirs to take back home, maybe little idols to take home with them. So there were a lot of shopkeepers making a lot of money. Now Paul is saying this is false religion. Diana is really not a goddess. This is false worship. It's wrong. You need to stop it. So what they do is they get all the people together who are making money on the on the of false worship. Ephesus itself, the thing that Ephesus was most famous for was Diana. That's the reason people knew about the city. So they, they whip everybody on the street up into uh, a fit of anger and they begin to shout, great is Artemis or great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they fill the city with confusion, and they drag out Paul's friends, and Paul wants to go out and speak to the mob, verse 30, but they won't let him. He wants to go out and talk to them. His friends say, if you go out there, they're going to tear you to pieces. You're not going out there. Um, and so what happens is that the Jews also use um, this opportunity. And for two hours, they're shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so the town clerk comes and says, You know, we can't have a riot because we have a riot. The Romans are going to come in and punish, punish us. So if there's a complaint, we're going to handle the complaint in a court of law not in a riot on the street. And so he dismisses the assembly, and Paul gets ready to leave. But what does Paul leave? He leaves a group of true believers, and he leaves a lot of angry unbelievers who want to start a riot and who want to throw him out of town. Now, the fact is, the gospel causes division. The name of Christ causes division. If you want to worship with your religion, nobody minds that. But if you say there's only one true religion, and the other religions are false religions, if you want to say your Savior is one of many saviors, your God is one of many gods, there's no problem with that. But if you say your Savior is the only Savior and the only hope of the world, if you say there's only one God and the other gods are false gods, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be controversy. There's going to be fights. There's going to be opposition. Do you know that one reason Christians were arrested in the first century was because they were charged with being atheists? 
Did you know that? This was the charge brought against Christians, atheism. You know why? Because they said that the gods of the Greeks and the Romans were not gods. They said that the emperor was not a god. So they charged them with atheism because they said these are no gods. When we think of atheists, we think of somebody who says nobody's a god. But in the first century, Christians were accused of atheism because they said all these gods you worship are not gods at all. There's only one God. And the Romans said that's atheism. That's against the law. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.